It can sometimes be difficult to decide whether, as somebody with reactionary or traditionalist principles, to label yourself right-wing, or to consider yourself a fellow of those that do. This is because, very often, contemporary right-wingers commit just as many errors and act just as disgustingly as those on the left do. An insight, indeed a model for this form of outsider reactionary thought, can be found in the highly obscure but utterly incredible record written by a German author and socialite between 1936 and 1944. It was a secret work the writer had to keep hidden from the Gestapo and the SS. It was published in 1947, two years after he died, but met little recognition or acclaim. In recent years, it has been republished, but remains hopelessly esoteric, particularly on the political right, where really it should be considered a foundational and indeed sacred text. The author was one Friedrich Reck, and his book is known as The Diary of a Man in Despair. Friedrich Fritz Percival Reck Malekzeven was born on the estate of Malekzeven in Missouri, the son of the Prussian politician and landowner Hermann Reck. Reck first served as an officer in the Prussian army, but was dismissed due to diabetes, and later married Anna Louise Bertner in 1908. They had three daughters and a son before separating in 1930. Graduating from medical school in 1911, Reck was a ship surgeon in American waters for a year. Thereafter, he moved to Stuttgart to become a journalist and theatre critic. In 1933, Reck converted to Catholicism, and in 1935, he married Ermgard von Bork, with whom he had another three daughters. It appears that Reck aspired to aristocracy, and although in manners and upbringing he accomplished this par excellence, he had a tendency to spin stories about his life and background that were patently untrue. He even became a favourite among Munich's cultural elite for this storytelling ability. This is most clear in his name, Reck Malekzeven. He was not born with the Malekzeven suffix, but added it later in the fashion of German nobles whose home estates were often added to their names via a double barrel. Reck, in a way I personally admire, held an instinctive contempt for the masses as a political force, and an even stronger contempt for the managerial, clueless nature of his society's elites. Interestingly, he aspired to be a kind of quiet Bavarian farmer aristocrat, rather than a bombastic Prussian Junker, and on many occasions throughout the diary, Reck makes clear his scorn for the all-consuming Prussian militarism of his father's generation, personified by Bismarck, the scheming militaristic glutton who seeks to bring all, even other Germans, under the oppressive weight of Berlin. Reck saw the Nazis and their ill-fated world as the natural conclusion to 1870 and the final, partial convulsions of Prussianism. Although many reactionary souls feel that modernity becomes degraded so quickly that each new morning we, can, we contemplate with nostalgia yesterday's adversary, it is seemingly because of this sentiment that Reck is driven at times to write in an admiring way of men like Bismarck, because they seem a world better than Hitler. In a memorable section, Reck recalls seeing Hitler in a Munich restaurant one evening before the Austrian took power. There he sat, a raw vegetable Genghis Khan, a teetotaling Alexander, a womanless Napoleon, an effigy of Bismarck, who would certainly have had to go to bed for four weeks if he had ever tried to eat just one of Bismarck's breakfasts. It is this authentic contempt for all forms of modernity that makes Reck, in my opinion, one of the greatest thinkers of the reactionary canon, even though his output was fairly small and generally concerned one regime. The staunchly Nazi intellectual Bruno Brehm wrote about Reck that he wanted to live the life of a nobleman, even though he was not noble, an estate owner, even though he was no farmer. He plays the role of an officer, even though he is no soldier, because he cannot obey. He is a refugee from Prussia in Bavaria because Prussia is too disciplined, but he plays the Prussian to the Bavarians and pretends to the unwitting Prussian that he is a Bavarian. He is always something other than what he is, because that what he is is not honest. Reck's political and philosophical position is rather close to that of the Colombian philosopher Nicolas Gomez, the authentic reactionary, and somebody who also wrote contemptuously of the modern world. Like Gomez, Reck is a cultured fellow who reads widely, inhabits a rural estate, and lives by a gentlemanly code of conduct. Most importantly, neither of the two men can really be pinned to a particular ism. Both were traditionalist in their outlook and sceptical of humanity which is the most succinct way to sum up their worldviews. Again, like Gomez, 
Rec was well connected among the elite of his time and often recalls meetings with notable political or cultural figures. Professionally, Rec had been a fairly successful author, and along with a popular comedic novel, Bombs on Monte Carlo, he also wrote two notable history books, intended as covert slights against Hitlerism and modern politics in general. One of these books was Bockelson, a historical work in literary form. It was subtitled History of Mass Delusion and published in 1937. My German is very cursory, but I have been able to read large parts of the book with help from a polyglot friend. For context, Jan Bockelson of Leiden was a tailor who led a mass uprising in the city of Munster in 1534. He and his followers established a theocratic utopia, which quickly descended into a disgusting mayhem. Bockelson became an absolute dictator, introduced polygamy, and began a campaign of political terror that only ended when princely forces captured the city the following year. The book is a dangerously obvious commentary on the Third Reich, a fact Reck even points out in the diary. His second historical work was in the style of a novel, Charlotte Corday, Story of an Assassination. For those unaware, Charlotte Corday was a woman who, having gained access to the chambers of Jean-Paul Marat, stabbed him while he was bathing. Despite herself being a radical, Corday has become something of a mythic hero among traditionalists for her murder of one of the revolution's most radical figures. Indeed, by killing Marat, she believed she was saving France from radical excess and even civil war. Charlotte Corday was executed by guillotine four days later. Rec was a personal admirer of Corday, and at one point even came close to shooting Hitler himself, something I will discuss later on. He once again intended this work to be a slight against Nazism, and having been able to secure an English copy, I can confirm that the text is indeed dripping with barbed and stinging literary allusions. Neither of these works was banned or censored, nor did Rec get into any trouble for them. In the case of Bockelson, this is likely because the book is dressed up like some arcane tome, complete with numerous Latin phrases and tags, copious footnotes, and other learned but not academic devices. This is what likely kept Rec off the censors list, although eventually readers began to complain to the authorities of the dangerous content of Bockelson, and the book was pulled from the shelves. Throughout the period the diary was written, from 1936 to 1944, Reck remained in relative isolation on his estate at Paising, on the rural outskirts of Munich with his wife. He makes trips around the country, mostly to Berlin, usually to see friends or fellow cultural elites, but these become increasingly rare and fraught with depressing observations the state around him decays and collapses. In October of 1944, he notes that the Nazi authorities are becoming suspicious of him. On the 13th of October, he's arrested and charged with the serious offence of undermining the morale of the armed forces, which could be punished by death on the guillotine. After some days in prison, he was released following the surprise intervention of sympathetic SS general. However, he was arrested again on the 31st and charged with insulting the German currency. This appeared to be the result of a letter he had written to his publisher, in which he complained that the inflation rate of the Deutschmark was eroding the value of his literary royalties. On the 9th of January 1945, he was transferred to Dachau, where disease was widespread. He soon became ill, and an official death certificate states he had died of typhus on the 16th of February. May 1936. Spengler is dead then. And just as a deceased Maharaja has the right to have all his retainers buried with him, this preponderant personality was, a few days later, followed in death by Albers, who would handle his work at the Beck publishing firm. Albers died in a truly grisly fashion. He threw himself under the wheels of the Starnberg train, and his bloody corpse was found on the tracks, legs severed at the thighs. This first paragraph sets a grim tone for the rest of the book. Although the diary often gets one to laugh, the humour is frequently pitch black, and by the end I felt rather hollowed out and melancholy. The effect is not singular, and I felt the same way each of the five times I reread the work. The descent into perfectly predictable apocalypse is made all the more crushing to witness by the fact that the author died needlessly in the camps, an expression of the impotent, childish wrath of a farcial regime. One word that appears frequently throughout the diary is Erzatz. The word literally means substitute in German, and as a result of reading the book, now comes to mind every time I think of Hitler and the Reich. 
As early on as 1939, Reck writes, Berlin smells of war and strikes me as looking the way a parvenu never should. Shabby, wan, ridiculous. The menus offer little. The wine is even more questionable than usual. Linen is of doubtful cleanliness. The coffee is miserable. There's no petrol for the taxis. And since repairmen have been drafted for work on fortifications, the hotels are in a miserable state. All kinds of things are now visible under the plushy, stuccoed, bronze junk, which formerly concealed the down hills artifice, which is Prussia's natural style. In a more humorous yet still poignant turn, Rec recalls how a man was clapped on the shoulder of his cardboard-infused wool suit and absent-mindedly blurted out, Come in. He writes of how most of the available wine is a horrendous mixture of sugar and sulfur concocted by the industrial giant IG Farben. The Ertzatz drink is so hazardous that in some cases, the organs of those who drink it become choked with bilge, killing them. At the same time, vast amounts of fine wines, champagnes and produce looted from France and other occupied territories are guzzled down by SS officers and the Nazi higher-ups. It's very sad to see so many anonymous legions of people, mostly online, calling themselves right-wing and reveling in the apparent power of the Third Reich. Images of goose-stepping soldiers, rolling columns of tanks and pure mechanised efficiency are really something of a spook especially when contrasted with the visions of political absurdity Rec presents us with. Far from young, square-jawed heroes off to fight Bolshevism, we see a scene from a nightclub. Filled with young men of the rural nobility, all of them in SS uniforms, having a fine time dropping pieces of ice down the décotelages of their ladies, and with their mouths retrieving the pieces of ice from the horrible depth amid general jubilation. To observe these men meant looking at the unbridgeable abyss that separates all of us from the life of yesterday. True, the beer bellies and the bags under the eyes are gone. The faces are lean and narrow. At first they look like a group of dragon killers or archangels who have left their wings in the cloakroom. Until a second, harder look. Until the sound of this whorehouse jargon and the coarseness of their expressions brings a quite different analogy to mind. The first thing is the frightening emptiness of their faces. Then one observes in the eyes a kind of flicker from time to time, a sudden lighting up. This has nothing to do with youth. It's a typical look of this generation, the immediate reflection of a basic and completely hysterical savagery. Some of the most languid scorn of Rex's work, however, is reserved for Hitler himself. First meeting the Austrian in 1920, he recalls that Hitler talked on and on endlessly. He preached. He went on at us like a divisional chaplain in the army. The servants thought we were being attacked and rushed in to defend us. When he had gone, we sat silently confused and not at all amused. There was a feeling of dismay when, on a train, you suddenly discover you are sharing a compartment with a psychotic. It was not that an unclean body had been in the room, but something else. The unclean essence of a monstrosity. I got the impression of basic stupidity. The same kind of stupidity as that of his crony, Parpin. The kind of stupidity which equates statesmanship with cheating at horse trade. I do not even believe that the man is especially immoral. The title of the great criminal does him too much honour. If a German government had built a gigantic studio, subsidised the papers to declare him the greatest artist of all time, and managed to satisfy his limitless vanity that way, I believe he would have turned completely to harmless pursuits and would never have gotten the idea of setting fire to the world. Referring earlier to the information about Charlotte Corday's murder of Marat, there is a memorable scene in which Reck recalls how he dined at the same restaurant as Hitler in 1932. Due to the deteriorating situation there, Germany's streets were unsafe, and so Reck happened to be carrying a loaded revolver. Hitler and his company, without guards, sat down at the nearest table. Reck would have done it without a second thought, he tells us. If I had an inkling of the role this piece of filth was to play, and of the years of suffering he was to make us endure, I would have done it without a second thought. But I took him for a character from a comic strip, and I did not shoot. When observing Hitler at a Munich rally much later, Reck writes, There he stood, the most glorious of all, in his usual pose, hands clasped over his belly, looking with his silver decorated uniform and cap drawn far down over his forehead, like a tram conductor. I examined his face through my binoculars. The whole of it waggled with unhealthy cushions of fat. It all hung, it was all slack and without structure. Slaggy, gelatinous, sick. There was no light in it. None of the shimmer and shining of a man sent by God. Instead, the face bore the stigma of sexual inadequacy, 
of the rancor of a half-man who had turned his fury and his impotence into brutalizing others. And through it all, this bovine and moronic roar of hile, hysterical females, adolescents in a trance, an entire people in the spiritual state of howling dervishes. And I reflected again on this thick-witted mob and its bovine roar, of this failure of a Moloch to whom this crowd was roaring homage, and on the ocean of disgrace into which we as a nation have sunk. This people is insane. It will pay dearly for its insanity. The air of the summer is full of foreboding, and fire and iron must heal what no physician can no longer care. Nicolas Gomez wrote often of the bourgeois soul, and how it has conquered the two other parts of traditional society, the plebeian and the aristocrat. This grieving, bitter sentiment is present in great amounts through Rex's diary. In 1942, he wrote, I will never change my belief that mass man is by no means identical with the proletariat. The mass type is now to be found much oftener in the boardrooms of the large corporations and among the sons and daughters of rich industrialists than among workers. The fact is that we here are dealing with pestilence, some unnameable kind of biological disillusion that began in the higher reaches of our social structure. It is remarkable to see Rex succinctly detail his worries about what in our community, 80 years on, we call bio-Leninism. In a passage worthy of Nietzschean scorn, Rex compares mass man to a cancer, the same defective biological structure, the same tendency towards early death and decay, the same reproductive explosiveness, and the same anarchic emergence of previously fixed forms. As a reactionary, I often feel a great worry that our cultural artefacts and treasures will not only be forgotten by those charged with preserving them, but actively destroyed. Rec, in sharing this, references Spengler's apocalyptic vision in which the last violin lies broken on the ground, the last copy of Mozart's quartets go up in flames, the slighting of Gothic cathedrals, and the final possible performance of Bach's Chacon long given. Rec retains one, and only one enduring hope that this horde of what he calls degenerate football players will not survive the fire they started. Indeed, to illustrate his point about the bourgeois, specifically German urge to consume or destroy what cannot be consumed, Reck recounts two stories from the First World War involving the destruction of priceless treasures. The first was of a number of soldiers garrisoned at Misothen Castle, who, on a freezing night, burned practically all of the centuries-old manuscripts and extremely rare first editions in their stove to keep warm. Rec notes that this was in some ways forgivable. The soldiers did not know the value or provenance of what they were burning. They merely needed to keep warm for the night and burned the first papers they could find. The second story concerns one Prince Ruprecht, an army commander in the First World War, who pleaded with his superior, General Ludendorff, not to destroy the castle of Cusi, originally built in the 13th century. It had no military value to either the French or the Germans and had, up until then, been avoided by both sides. Once the fort was brought to Ludendorff's attention, he had it dynamited, simply to spite Prince Ruprecht. The latter tale makes the soldiers cluelessly burning Miss Sothen Castle's library look like saints in comparison to the active and aware Ludendorff. There is no better indictment against Germanic militarism, so often spoken of admiringly in writers' circles. Indeed, Rex's hatred for the Prussian aristocracy may have been what caused his alienation from his father, who wanted nothing more than to belong to that group. In a testament definitively proving the aristocratic nature of his soul, Rec defends the making of distinctions and the maintaining of standards. Do they really think they're going to stop us from making distinctions and reduce everything to a dead level? They quote a Brigalian feast with a modern meal out of cans, the rewards of an auto trip with that of a walking tour, the costly silk stockings of yesterday and the rayon silk stockings of today's office girls. Is the sexual awakening which used to come brevi manu in the haystack to be paralleled by a lecture course given by the right sphere of women, with or without practical demonstrations? This disgusting embrace of any and all modern methods to reshape society is a tedious hark back to the French Revolution, and should firmly remind those with any doubt that Nazism and rightist radicalism in general is not a reactionary sprouting and must be stepped over. This fact reveals itself in the most striking, disgusting, and indeed saddening way, merely 15 pages into the diary. In the summer of 1936, Rex stayed for a few days in Munich City, 
and was awoken one morning to see a troop of Hitler youth marching by, blaring their trumpets and banging their drums. The troop entered a dis disused schoolroom directly opposite Rex's lodging, where they were apparently staying, and within a minute a young, soft-faced boy had become contorted with fury. He ran behind the desk at the front of the room and tore down the sizable crucifix which was hanging there. He tore down the image of Christ, to which all the cathedrals of Europe and the ringing psalms are devoted to, and threw it into the dirt of the street, with a cry, LIE THERE, YOU DIRTY JEW! The plot of July 1944 has generally been remembered as a heroic event in the history of World War II, particularly from the anti-Nazi perspective. Rex's hatred for Hitler and his regime has been so fervent throughout the diary that you expect him to heap praise upon the plotters for their ever so close attempt on Hitler's life. In fact, Rex has nothing but hatred, contempt and scorn for them. Literarily, this three-page section is the piece de resistance of the entire book. I will not quote directly from it for that reason. It must be read first hand. I cannot do it justice here. Reck wastes no time in pointing out that the attempt on Hitler's life was not carried out because of any principled rejection of Nazism. It was those same generals and politicians that heralded Hitler's rise to power, who conquered Europe for him, who swore their total allegiance and loyalty towards him. That is, until the game began to slip, and their own lives seemed destined for the Russian firing squad, unless drastic action was taken. Reck, admirably, is a philosophical monarchist and, as such, values loyalty as one of the highest attributes among men. He mocks the plotters for having assisted Hitler into power, thus betraying the republic they swore to serve, a state which itself they created by betraying their Kaiser, to whom they had also sworn an oath of loyalty. The men who planned the 1944 coup have been eulogised in the West, but Reck tears off the cloth barely a day after the event took place and reveals the truth. Those men were not heroes. They were merely scared, disloyal cowards who feared the repercussions of their own actions. Indeed, this scorn can equally fall upon the entire German nation. It was bovine slavishness over Hitler, his plundering of the world until the Battle of Stalingrad that Rep writes was when the mood snapped back into guilty fear. In July of 1944, Reck had written a letter to his publisher, in which he noted that the severe wartime inflation of the Deutschmark had devalued his literary royalties to practically nothing. Following what was probably a denunciation of somebody at his publisher's office, Reck was taken to Dachau concentration camp on the 9th of January 1945, on the charge of insulting German currency. His number was 137838. Conditions in the camps were, by this stage of the war, at their worst. Thousands of prisoners were shipped in from the east as the Red Army overran already existing facilities by the dozens. Disease and malnutrition spread with appalling speed, and within a week of his arrival, Reck was signed in at the camp sick bay, arguably a death sentence in itself. Men over 50, like Reck, had a mortality rate of some 80%. He is thought to have died on the 16th of February. However, this may not have been the real end of Friedrich Reck. A Dutch writer named Nico Rost was sentenced to the Dachau concentration camp around the time Reck was there. In his book, Goethe in Dachau, he recalls meeting a fellow prisoner emerging from the hospital section. The prisoner was very thin, extremely nervous, and completely exhausted. He told Rost that he himself was a doctor, although he had not practiced medicine for some 30 years. He gave his name, Friedrich Rech Malekzeven. Are you the writer? Rost asked him. Yes, came the reply. Rost was familiar with Bockelson and bombs on Monte Carlo. The man's tongue loosened and he talked endlessly about his estate in Bavaria, his career as a cavalry officer, and his admiration for the Bavarian royal family, long since deposed. It was terrible, Rost wrote, to see him standing before me, weakened by hunger and trembling with nerves, in trousers far too short for him, and a green Italian military shirt with one arm missing. Miserable, ill, starving, old. This man certainly is Rech Malekzeven, but is he really identical with the writer? Rost supposes that this man was not Rech at all, but merely somebody who said yes when they heard the name, something to grasp at to maintain conversation before death took them. 
This incident apparently took place on the 15th of April, two months after Rex's death, and only a few weeks before the liberation of the camp. Did he really survive this long? Camp staff had no reason to prematurely declare his death. Moreover, an acquaintance of Rex imprisoned in the same facility testifies that he did indeed die on the 16th of February. It is sadly ironic that what may be our final glimpse of Friedrich Rex, a man so famous throughout his life for weaving fantastical stories, might simply be a pretender. A fitting final episode of Deception. Mm -hmm.